Okay, so welcome very much for uh, joining us in today's um, as a Carbon training session. Um, we've got the privilege of having Andy Hals. Andy, I think you are the first, the first of the Kanban trainers that you are the second time in appearing here. I know, so, I'm privileged. I, I must be that awesome. <laughs> last time you you did you had a wonderful session with um, James Mayer yeah. and you and, and me there, so we, we had a great session. But this time we, we also are doing this because you have written a book in the last few months. Well, well months, uh, years. Oh, crumbs. Yeah, we'll talk about lockdown. <laughs> One of those lockdown projects. Huh? Yeah. Um, so um, usually we're going to do Q&A. We've got a people, um, few people in, in attendance. We'll try to make it as a dialogue. But, you know, while people come up with answers, so they, they, they write their answers, so they, they, they think about questions. So no answers, questions as well. Um, let, let's just a quick chat about the, the book. Yeah. Um, so um, remind us of the title and why did you write the book? What was the uh okay so <laughs> the title is so well the title yeah the title is applying uh scrum with Kanban and um it, it had it had many other titles and we kind of uh uh steve traps another um scrum trainer from scrum.org we kicked around and he's another he is actually a pro Kanban trainer as well and we kicked around a few ideas we sent him out on linkedin as some kind of like subtitles because the, the subtitle is a pointless book um and it <sighs> Yeah, you know, I and I and I do have quite a few references to story points. It's all it's uh, so so it's kind of like a, a take on the whole story point thing. And um, uh, so that's the title. Applying uh, applying from a Kanban uh, can be found on all good bookshops that rhyme with Amazon. <laughs> so you can you can get it. And I've I've applied it so it goes globally um, uh, with Amazon. Uh, the, the longer story is Amazon are yet to pay me, but that's a whole different story. So so, but you should be able to get it in any region. Um, uh, yeah, why did I write the book? Um, I'd come out of two years of putting, uh, together, um, a kind of, a, a scaled kind of scrum with Kanban, um, a bit of work with multiple teams, something up to like eight teams and looking at how that then scaled up into the program. Um, I'd also come out of trying to help um uh generate kind of interest in the in the professional uh, uh scrum with kanban um course from scrum.org kind of again it was joining the two approaches together because what everyone will have experienced is there's lots of shouting well no actually not anymore thankfully but there used to be right and there used to be a lot of like kanban is brilliant and only applies here and scrum only applies here and scrum's brilliant and then you'd have all these blogs and this is the one that really bugs me is scrum versus kanban right it's like 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 there's a choice you know but you know you can only make one choice i don't know it just really really bugged me so um so i'd come out of a couple of years of doing some really good work with a whole bunch of people and uh using scrum and kanban i was like there's a guide the the um kanban guide was coming out later that year and it was um there's uh, a course but there's nothing to kind of tell a story. There was nothing to say, I'm, I'm a scrum master. I might not know enough about Kanban. I kind of know scrum, but I don't really know what Kanban is going to give me or even how to kind of go and put it in place. And so, so that's where the book started. Um, and I'm assuming that, I mean, when we're talking about these things, it's always going to be, scrum master I and mean, if you are a scrum master yeah um and you are a proficiency proficient scrum master in your experience as well what is it about kanban that what does kanban do that makes this scrum with kanban something something interesting awful oh. or, or powerful amazing yeah. Yeah. well this is the thing that gets me right and and um uh if you're a scrum master, you're probably already doing Kanban bits, right? So mm -hmm. you've probably already got a board, right? And you've probably already mapped a flow. The the thing that made me laugh the most when I was creating the book, the thing that made me laugh the most was um, for many years, people had said, uh, get a post-it and put dots on it, you know, like mark the days. <laughs> 
and I was like, yeah, that's really cool. And then then we'd get to the end of the screen, yeah. we'd have a load of post-its with um with dots on them, but actually like it didn't tell us anything. <laughs> we just didn't know what to do with it, right? <laughs> so so there are all these kind of things that as a scrum master you're probably doing, you're probably having a conversation about which items uh, you know is going slowest, but you're not having it with a mindset that to take action. You're just kind of really interested and you're trying to help the team work with flow, but it's not kind of prominent in your mindset so kind of the benefits of looking at kanban i don't know i don't really want to sell it but but you again it's that you're probably already doing it so let's take that journey a little bit further so let's look at the benefits of flow with scrum and actually starting to leverage and then starting to apply metrics right because because limiting with visualizing um work in progress um and my favorite uh, you know, out of all of them, if you're going to go like, you know, if there was a question, which is your favorite Kanban practice? Like, you know, you have to make a choice, but <laughs> it's, my favorite is the active management, right? Like really paying attention to the work in progress. You might have a great flow. You might have all the whip limits in the world, right? But if you're not paying any attention to the work, hence the dots, hence the metrics, hence the, the attention to value flow, yeah, you know, you, you're on a loser. Yeah. See, uh, as you say in this, you know, in in teaching Scrum, teaching Kanban, and things like that, one of the things that was resonating with me, and one thing that I would usually say in coaching and training, is this is this thing about the many times in the Scrum, I'm Scrum and Kanban and are fully compatible. So you're right. When people have the one or the other, either we don't understand this, or we have something to sell. I would say something. Yeah. But what is really interesting for me many times, um, is particularly around Kanban and the whole idea, uh, around Scrum and the whole idea of self-organization, self-management, yeah, where we we had the we talk about self-organization, but we don't really in the Scrum world we don't really say how that happens. And for me, one thing that you do with the metrics, with the camera, with the workflow, active management, of work, it's all about really powerful techniques, though. Yeah, and it, well, it, and and oh god, another another thing I would say, right? So 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 this like this whole idea of agile and agility, like it's like you know, go back to nineteen eighty six and the Harvard Business Review and the new new product development game, right? One of my favorite what if I had to pick a favorite white paper in the world, right? But it, it's the white paper nobody reads, but we always reference. Go, like, I don't know if you can put a link in in for people to go and read it, but do go and read it. It's really interesting because it basically talks about this holistic approach. Uh, 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 Takeuchi and Onaka, one's based in Japan, one's based in America. They're looking at Honda, they're looking at 3M, they're looking at Canon, they're looking at Epson or one of the other kind of printer manufacturers. And they're, they're looking at the way they approach, uh, you know, Honda building a really terrible, if you go and Google the car they created, it was terrible and horrible. But but the, the idea behind how they created it was really fascinating. And that's the basis for this whole agility thing. And then it kind of went into the software development world and it became loved by software developers. And then like, you know, and, and just I hold the pause there. It was loved by software developers. You know, fast forward what we 20, 30 years now, and uh, God, almost 40. That's showing the age, right? Showing my age. I know it. Um, uh, that it, it's become a management context thing, problem to go and solve. So when we talk about metrics and taking care of, I guess, your own destiny in that in that way, we should, you know, this self management, but it should be pushed back into the hands of the developers. And, and let's yes. let's let's just say for a minute, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're doing Kanban, Scrum, whatever, you know, pick a random banana thing, right? You know, it's it's more about the people acting against the problem than it is a framework that's going to help you. You know, a frameworks will help you have a conversation, and that's and that's where these things come in. Mm -hmm. But but taking charge of your own kind of destiny should be the first thing we talk about when we build teams. How are we going to, how are we going to truly understand what we're doing, how we're doing, how we're doing it? Are we doing the right thing? Are we building it? Well, you know, those kind of conversations. So the metrics then, then should come into play at a team level, not a management level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all these things are really for the teams to be able to, yeah, yeah. to make better decisions. I, I like how Dan Bacanti keeps talking about it. The, Good Kanban helps people ask better questions earlier on. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, I I call um, 
I call Scrum a conversation framework. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and if you take away, because mm -hmm. I think what people tend to get caught up with Scrum is they tend to think Scrum's like this weird container of doom. <laughs> I ran a course today and it's like how I described it, right? My brain was like, it's a, people think it's a weird container of doom where nothing like you go into it and something happens and then all of a sudden you kind of burst out and you may have done something correct. Like throw all that stuff away and think it's just a, it's just a, like it's a scheduler in your, in your calendar to have a conversation. Every day we're going to talk about something. Every month or less, we're going to have a structured conversation, but we could have them more often and more regular. You know, then then Kanban comes in and says, well, look, here's some here's a different perspective on that conversation. And how early do you want to have that conversation about whether you're doing the right thing or not? You know, and that's that's what we that's really where we're going with all this stuff. They they both have their their powers, but you know, one it's just just that slightly different lens. You know, what do you want to what do you want to be focusing on today? Is it the flow of work? Is it the the value you're delivering, or do we need to do something kind of more structured around this and have a conversation with our stakeholders to get some different feedback, different perspective, different lens? Yes, I'm building on what you just said and how you're talking about this thing about the conversation side of it. Um, many times, come on, or people people see come on as a fairly mechanistic process. I'm going to say process obsessed way of looking at work. While you're talking about Kanban as a conversation, as a collaboration, as a, mm. a much more humanistic thing like yeah. that. What's, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, how do you see those? Well, you can look at, uh, it's like, a, you know, everything could be, everything could be turned to evil. <laughs> I think we've got enough, we've got enough kids films with villains in it, you know, just to, to, to give us that perspective. I think um, th that's, a, I mean, that's, that's truly a symptom. Um, uh I, so i'm going to call it mechanical scrum mechanical kanban can also exist uh, mm -hmm. people call it zombie scrum i don't like that as a term i i, I prefer the mechanic the, see if you talk about it as a mechanical it implies routine mm -hmm. you talk about it from a zombie point of view it means you're brain dead and i don't think people are brain dead i think people just get caught in routines yeah so so yeah you know to, to bounce that back right is yeah with anything you can get caught in a routine with if you wanted to look at Kanban as some linear process, right? Even like, let's let's really kind of stretch it and say, well, it's a linear water, waterfall visualization of how you work. Yeah, you know, you could you could look at it at that lens, but you know, then start to add the human side in. And we've got to take care of people first. Mm -hmm. Then we start to look at our mechanical process and say, are we doing the right thing? How can we inspect and adapt? But it goes back to that active management. This is why I love active management, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you're not actively managing the work, you're going to be mechanical about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, when, when we talk about actively managing flow of work, what do we, what do we mean by that? What, what do we, how does it feel? How does it taste? How does it look? Yeah, like? no, I, I see, I see where you're going with that, right? It's not, it's, it's, um, it's isn't it? Is that yeah, it's uh, passion. Okay. Right. If okay. if I'm gonna if I'm gonna if I'm gonna bounce that right, so it's passion from a team about what they're working on. That like trying to build a passion for the product mm -hmm. and passion to do the right thing. And I'm not talking like you know throw away Kanban and Scrum for a minute, right? Throw away all of that stuff. Is you get a team to get you get a team of people together. Um, and a great example, I was working at a company and this is the kind of like, you know, I'd love to say the name type stuff, but we were building a really, truly sucky product. Hence why I'm not saying the name. Okay. It was, it was, it was a sucky product. They knew the, the company knew it was a bit sucky. We were trying to improve it. It was hard to work on for the team. The team were really struggling, legacy code, a lot of technical debt uh, and process that kind of as inhibitors. But if, by, by kind of giving them the, the, I guess, the autonomy to make decisions about making their lives better, right? So from a code point of view, what they build and how they build it, they built, they built that kind of sense of collective ownership. They also built a little bit of passion into making, trying to make their lives easier. Yeah. Rather than trying to make a sucky product amazingly better, it was actually became an objective. How can we make our lives easier when we're building this product? Right? How can we improve this product and keep it going? So you know, then you can then you can throw in a you know a, 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 any kind of framework around that. But it's again, it goes back to the team and the you know the active management stuff. 
paying attention to the work and you know you can you could use metrics you could use dots on cards you could use aging you could use all these things right as a way of uh, an indicator to get people to focus mm -hmm. but until you solve that human problem you're not going to get yourself out of that cycle that's right um so um, there is a question that we have from from martin martin cape he has a lot of background in the noise so i will read the question um and it's, a, it's connected to where you were saying here. It's like for, for you and your, your experience, Andy, what is the most important thing to get right when starting with Kanban? Oh, like, what's the most important thing to get right? Yeah. I think, you know, if you, if you looked at, if you looked at Kanban, all right, if I, if I take it from a Kanban lens, right, I think it's, uh, I'm still going on that human track. <laughs> it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, getting the behaviors in allowing the team to have that control and ownership of their workflow and boosting confidence about this is their thing right? mm -hmm. and uh, we can adapt we can change we can learn and we can understand you know, you can you can say, well, you, you you know, you you start with the um, you start with the workflow, right? And you, you know, you, but you, then you have to have the the whip limits, then you have to have the active management, and then we have to you know look at the flow metrics, right? And they're, they're all massively important. But again, I can, sorry to kind of you know it feels like a cop out, but actually, I just want to withdraw it back to the team if they've got a kind of a clear understanding of what are we trying to achieve by going down this route? Why why are we picking Gamman for a start, right? What benefits are you, is it going to give you? Mm -hmm then looking at the almost doing a team charter around it right what are we what are we expecting to to get out of this and how are we going to you know the, the policies you know around it are probably the most important thing maybe you know from that perspective from a human perspective you know how how are we going to actively manage this work what are the rules what are the what are the constraints we want to put in place so we're not kind of doing ourselves a, a dis, disservice you know an injustice <laughs> you know in that way mm -hmm. um, Cool. Um, I don't know if Martin, I know he has a lot of background noise, whether there's a follow up. Um, anybody else, any questions as well we can ask. Um, so, uh, Andy, I mean, obviously the the, um, the, the, the the Kanban guide for the Scrum teams, the the Kanban guide on its own <laughs> without Kanban, without Scrum, um, are relatively, um, you know, recent works. I mean, we just, we just captured things that were already happening in the market out there. But if you were going to back like five, six, ten years, you know, when, when, whenever whenever you were starting with your, your scrums and so on, what sort of thing, what do you think, like looking at today, what do you think would be most surprising to you or things that you would say, damn, I, I, I wish I would have known this? You know what? I, um... I mean, yeah, again, a fantastic question. And uh, 2008 was was Nokia, and uh, and we. Uh, I was working for Nokia Music or Nokia, depending on how you want to say it. But uh, Nokia Music in Bristol, and we went through a huge um, upheaval. It's a great story, and it's a story I really want to tell at some point. Mm -hmm. At some point over the next like three years, there there was a guy, and I and um, I don't know where he, I don't know where he is now, but a, a, probably a year ago or two years ago, I ran past him when I was running around Bristol once, and his name's Tom Leggett, and I've given him a shout out once before. So back in you know two thousand eight, two thousand nine, he was already calling out Kanban. He was saying we need to be paying attention to this. This is really interesting way of working. Now I was on. A different floor doing building the same product but we were we had our own problems back then and i was like yeah dude i haven't got time for that i've got bigger scrum problems to go and figure out of it you know if i look back you know however many years ago that was i don't know what's that over 10 12 13 years ago you know whenever that was happening um i i don't know i you know i wouldn't change a thing but i, I just think uh it's yeah. You know, it's interesting to kind of think about how kind of Kanban has always been there. It's kind of always been there in the background. And it just feels over the last 
it's kind of got a, a bigger movement over the last I don't know, five or six years at least. Um, and now, you know, again, it, for good reasons, it's it's kind of <laughs> kind of like XP. XP is always there, but it's <laughs> XP is yeah. coming back, right? Um, uh, you know, quite rightly, because they all have their benefits. Um but yeah, you know, Tom Leggett, uh, uh, he was he was doing, I think it was like head of Oracle in Bristol for a little while. You know, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know whether I wish I'd paid more attention to him, but I'd certainly remember, you know, him calling it out back then and just, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, kind of, it probably would have been the, the start of things if I'd have paid more attention, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It, it brings me up because back, back around that time, um, I was talking about Kanban in the company I was working with. Actually, what I was meaning by them was just just using color post-its. <laughs> yeah, I, I I mean, I don't I don't think you know, if it, think back then it, it didn't have all the metrics attached to it, so so it was just visualization and limiting width, which again hugely powerful, right? And and even you know like color post-its, you know, identifying work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some great stories from that time of the wall, the wall of the wall of bugs, <laughs> where we had so many defects, so many post-its on a wall. You know, we didn't know what to do with them. It's brilliant. So many stories from that place. This is where, where, where you move office to have more space for the wall of bugs. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, that was that was <laughs> you know there's so many, but you know it's again it was kind of you know that that whole self management piece. I mean we we. We went through several, uh, we, it was probably kind of highly adaptive. It was an incredible place to work. We had a, a, we were a closed unit. And this is when we talk about kind of agile and, and really, you know, great agile experiences. But we were a closed unit of uh, 150 people with a management team who were highly adaptive. Right? And they were really, really bought into agility. You know, we were led by a, a Finnish, uh, Ari Van something, and I'm going to have to look his name up. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, uh, he had a great kind of sense of what agility was back then. Um, was that Ari Van Benigan? No. Might have been. They're all called Ari Van something. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look him up. But, but yeah. Um, you, just got a you, just got the, you just got the name called Ari. <laughs> okay. um, we've got a question by, by Michael. Michael, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like us to, to read it out? If you want to ask the question, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. And if not, I'll read it out. On the uh, yeah, I mean, I can read it out. I can ask myself if that works. Yeah. So, so the question from Michael is, uh, how can we sell probabilistic uh, versus deterministic, right, to product people when it comes to forecasting this tough move? Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> read my book. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> uh, the. I mean, I do talk about probabilistic and deterministic in there, and and actually, when I was writing the book, I went searching for. Um, loads of definitions like just to try to make sure when I talked about it I wanted to be correct and I really wanted to come from a um just a just a certainly around the the difference between deterministic and and probabilistic and try and kind of get some some good examples I still don't think I nailed it right In in my eyes right but um uh, but but from a so the way I always talk about deterministic and uh, I'm sure you may have heard this kind of thing before but it's it's like saying I've got a Christmas list of presents to buy you know I know my bank account and if I go and buy them I know what they cost on Amazon I know what my bank account is going to be at the end of it right that's kind of a deterministic way of approaching a problem um, you can't do that with complex work because we don't know how much these things cost you know we might know what we want. You know, we might know our bank balance, but we really just don't know how much they cost, right? And it's kind of almost being, you know, Santa Claus in that, that there's a bunch of kids around the world. They all need presents, but we don't know the kind of net effect until we've actually kind of gone and done some work into delivery and, you know, timescales. You know, I think there's the um, part of your question is how can you sell, you know, and, and I'm a, just a big believer in just trying to figure out a workshop that will demonstrate it you know and that's probably where you you know if you understand the differences and um i would urge you to have a have a look at um dan mccanty's talk about hurricanes and forecasting yeah that's a great one so so uh in the book i talk about um a degree of variance and and the way i draw it in class is i always talk about this it being a sine wave 
So if you make a kind of no classical, you know, kind of like your music or your electronic kind of idea of sound, and it has this wave. And if we think of like an average through the middle, you know, there's a degree of variance in there, which is which is basically your probabilistic forecast. It's like the sometimes we're good, sometimes we're bad, sometimes we're good. Um, you know, and you can look at it as like a a pathway, and this is how how Dan kind of talks about it in his talk, which is you know hurricanes have a degree of variance in their travel so they may they may go north they may go kind of east or west you know and and it's trying to kind of get over that kind of analogy that right now we know where we are but because we're unpredictable and because we have a kind of a, some kind of unpredictable ahead of, ahead of us our degree of variance is you know quite wide or it might be more narrow so i would uh, you know i would encourage you to have a think about what kind of workshop you could run around that is there are there examples where you work that you could kind of say okay so this is our probabilistic approach versus deterministic or you know go and go and find something out there on the internet that speaks to that that works for you yeah um Dan Bacanti's talk um you can search on google is i think it's titled your project behaves like a hurricane that's the one yep yeah. why your project behaves like a hurricane yeah and it's a great really talk. good one i think uh there is a recording from lean agile scotland um conference yep. i remember a few years ago um yep. but, but that, that's that's the, the interesting thing that happens when it is about the deterministic and the probabilistic is that even if we know um even if we know that the the projects, the, the work that we do is potentially quite complex and variable and uncertain and so on. It's so easy for all of us to go into the trap of suddenly we have a target, we have an estimate, we could produce a deadline. And, that, and that's the deterministic thinking when you only end up with one possible answer. Yeah. Probabilistic, which is like, hey, you know, even if we are for forecasting means that there are many, many possible answers and you don't know which one is, which one of them is going to be right. So be yeah. comfortable with that. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and this is um, the, the fallacy of just placing maths in front of people. And, and OK, so for anybody who's kind of thinking about the uh, uh, the kind of the metric side of this stuff is, like I said, with all frameworks could be used for evil purposes, all, all metrics and maths can be used for evil purposes. You can tune anything to be whatever you want. Yeah. Um, you can, you, you know, you can make the numbers look pretty if that's what the management want, but you're, you're creating a kind of a fallacy there. And, um, and the, yeah, yeah, certainly when, again, in the book, I don't want to keep referencing the book. That just sounds really weird, but in the book, <laughs> in the book I talk about actually putting this stuff in place and, um, the change in conversation we had. So, so the so the book the somebody said about the book right they said uh, great, uh somebody I used to work with the Nokia funny enough and he said oh Andy the the examples in there are really cheesy and I said unfortunately they're my life yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what actually happened in a few cases yeah. um uh but but yeah so so in the book I talk about the different the change in conversation it goes back to that conversation framework and what conversation you want to be having but the metrics change the conversation. Yes, yes, they are they are numbers. Yes, you can say you can kind of go, yeah, that feels about right. That's what we might do. But they always have to have a they, they have to come with a caveat, right? This is what we know now, and this is where we believe, right? Yeah. Based upon if we're using actual agile or whether you're using my my dodgy spreadsheet that I created, you know, that I reference, right? But the, 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 the whole thing about it is it provides something for a conversation, whether it's incorrect or correct. And again, let's not ignore the outcomes and let's not ignore the people. Right? Again, if you fall into the trap of just doing math and worrying about the output, you're, you're basically looking at the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, so go, going over the, the, the metrics um, or things like that and the, the conversations that generate, um, all metrics being important, have you got a particular favorite? You're gonna, so you're gonna make me choose on everything tonight. I didn't, I didn't, you know. But I'm, I'm an agile coach. I sit on the fence. Isn't it's that? Not, it's not, it depends. It's not a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> we we never make any commitments as agile coaches. Um, uh, my favorite metric. Uh, I think I don't know. I want to say I want to say age, but actually, I feel cycle time is probably the thing that I think really. Uh, can I say kicks ass? Because I've already said it. Um, <laughs> I think it's the game change. I think age is age is a game changer. I think the SLE is the game changer. I think without um, 
without really looking at throughput, without looking at your cycle time, you're with age, you can have a, a tactical conversation about that day. You can have a tactical conversation about, you know, a period in time about the work, but to influence the conversation about when you have to have some kind of SLE, you have to have some kind of notion of throughput. You need that there. And I, I guess that's the difference between the age and the, the, the metric age and the chart, the aging. Yeah. Because the, the age is just how long have you been working on this? Yeah. Aging is yeah, but is it going well or not? And and in order yeah. to do that you need cycle time, you need SLEs. What's yeah, yeah, yeah. the point? Yeah. And as somebody said what are you comparing uh, against, yeah. Uh -huh. Well somebody asked me, said uh uh I, they were still confused about age. Uh, maybe I, uh, and you know, I might have not explained it very well. And so <laughs> another person on the call said it's like your life, right? Cycle time is when you're dead. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said to them, I said, I, this is when my brain was going with it, but I didn't want to say this out loud. Anyway, so somebody said, um, uh, and loved it. I loved it. Uh, great person on the course. She said, um, uh, cycle time is when you're dead. Age is wh wherever you are on that journey right now. And I was like, that's a really kind of morbid, kind of quite cool way of thinking about it. <laughs> morbidly accurate actually. morbidly accurate yeah so but but without i i guess you know you don't get to know when you die yeah but but you know you could look at uh we could look at population stats and say well you know you're you're you know for where you are your your age uh, sorry your your gender your location your health your diet you know all those kind of things you could probably say you know here's a rough pattern of you know when you're likely to die you know that's that could be the sle god no let's get off this we're stretching stretching this one but going into going into metrics i mean you you were talking about we were talking a little bit about the the mechanical mechanistic type of you know myth about kanban and so on what well, you can you can fall into that trap trap we talk about metrics metrics is math many yeah. times but you're talking about changing conversations. You're talking about the power of them. So how going to, I think connecting a little bit to the conversation, the, the question from, from Michael and Martin as well. How do you persuade someone that following things like metrics, things like, you know, how do we work your workflows and things like that? How do we persuade people that those things that appear to be potentially heavy yeah are actually really really amazing for for your professional life yeah how do we convince them other than i mean other than just like believe yeah <laughs> yeah and this is the thing i i i uh do i want to be the person who convinces people i think that's like you know i think that's my first problem you know i think uh one of the things i referenced was a a, a blog post i wrote uh 2018 i think it was around um it was how to it was a kind of an insight into how i coach kanban mm -hmm. and what i took was lean coffee right lean coffee is backlog structured process one thing at a time right limiting whip yeah etc so so i designed this this retrospective that basically went design your conversation and they said oh we'll we'll pick a topic we'll talk about the topic we'll make an action and we're done right cool you've just created a workflow right how many things can you talk about at any one time right you know one brilliant you've just created a whip limit you know so so that but that's my style that's how i that's how i work with teams of people is i don't i don't set out to convince them but i want to show them yeah. you know so if i need to do the the, the leg work to put and this is again back to where the book started coming out of that that a uh, bit of work which was i want to show them what's going on and then i can have a conversation about it mm -hmm. I'm not going to go in there and just say oh you need to do kanban you know because they're not going to come along that um if i think back to some of the work i was doing earlier this year and it was very much let's let, let tell you what tell, give me all your work right give me all your work where you think it is lots of conversations about workflow okay cool yeah that's really understand I'll, I'll go away. I'll put a workflow together. I'll put your work in there. And then I'm going to get everybody together. And then we're going to have a conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's and it's it's not convincing them. It's showing them and it's demonstrating. Mm -hmm. You know the current state where they are, what they're doing. Then you can start to have better conversation. You can start to say, okay, well, look, if we start to look at, you know, a metric over here, right? We can have a conversation about that. 
right. and that might help us you know let's look at let's look at the age across all of your items how long has that thing been in progress mm -hmm. why is it that so what I'm hearing is that the, the convincing is not about well it's not about convincing it's not about forcing people to do something it's more about enabling people to to see and do it themselves yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah. you were talking about simulations before I mean you didn't show I mean, in in my wife is a writer and in writing they had this idea of like show don't tell so you show things rather than tell them and, and that that's that's you've mentioned before simulations and things like yeah, that. yeah 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 are, are there any any particular simulations that you will say, oh, you know, this these are particularly useful in just generic Kanban. I mean, okay, of course, you can do the Kanban simulations, yeah. But yeah. Are there simulations, things like things like that, that you will say, like no, these are typically very powerful ones for for your context. It could be. It depends. Answer. I mean, it's not. It's not so much, and it depends. I think. Well, it kind of is, but <laughs> you can take right. So, so like, uh, let, let's go top three. Okay, uh, uh, top one would be get Kanban physical room. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can go back to a space where I can be in a room with people, mm -hmm. I would love that in a shot, you know, but anyway, so let's go like physical room. Let's go and get, get Kanban. Mm -hmm. Let's go and spend a lot of time, not, not half an hour, not, you know, an hour, but let's go and spend a lot of time and really dig into the behaviors here and, and play that game, not just play it. Um, then, then, then I'm torn, right? Because you've got you've got Twig, which is actual agile. Um, Twig, I think it was uh, Klaus Leopold with Dan Vacanti came together. They've created that that simulation mm -hmm. that resonates. So when in training classes, I play it twice. Um, first day, we play it right at the end when we've talked about camera, but we really haven't dug into it deeply enough, right? But we but they think they know what it is. Mm -hmm. So we play Twig, which is a Kanban simulation. Yeah. Day two, right? Kind of, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, we've talked about Kanban a load, right? You really, really get it now. Okay, you should, or you should do. You understand the metrics because they're embedded in Twig. Now let's go and play with Twig. Go and play with Twig. Reduce the whip limit. See the net effect on the metrics. Tell you what, do go crazy. Open up all the whip limits, right? Just drag work in, right? If 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 there's a space, fill it, right? You know, go and go and play with that. Then find a balance. And yeah, you know, so so that that really resonates with people. And I, I, we get a lot of people coming off the course, going, oh, "I'm going to take that back to my team and go and do some of that." You know, and but I'm torn, right? So option three would be doing something that fits the team. Okay. So I use retrospective time as a way. I think somebody said when they they left one of my teams and they said they said thank you Andy for every retrospective where I, where I had an education. It was kind of like you know you taught me something every retrospective and I was like actually I'm really quite proud of that because you know my my job is to try and help people and if through helping them discover better ways of working I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. And so um yeah, my my third my third on on the par with two would be, what am I seeing as a, you know, is it a policy problem? Is it a, a metric problem? Is it a you know flow problem? Whatever it is, let's go and build something around that to go and help demonstrate the the cause and effect of the choices they're making. That's good, very good, very powerful, very contextual driven as well in order to help with that. Yeah, excellent. So good combine twig get physical get combined oh yeah twig and then the, yeah and, and you have to get combined it will be what three four hours to play at least yeah 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 definitely i mean the, the physical one i really truly miss and I, they, they are they are still here in my my office i've still so i uh, had a really good friend of mine um help me we went to a printers and we got them uh, these huge i think they're post a1 maybe i think it is size board games so we've you know they unroll you have to stick them to the desk because they unroll and then they roll back up again because they're laminated but but yeah they they this it just makes it so much more tangible yeah uh, and that's the thing about like experiencing it is is really important for people to then start believing what's the value of it what's the benefit yeah. Co connecting to people's what's in it for me yeah, yeah actually do you know what the 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 the, the moment the moment that sticks out the most in my my brain which was um uh, taking a lovely chap called Mark Beard. He was the head product owner, chief product owner, right? And I, I got the privilege, I was privileged to be able to train a whole bunch of people. 
and big class, probably 20 people in the class, maybe less, right? Big class. And I remember, and I drew, I drew, um, uh, I, I drew Little's Law, mm-hmm. right? The kind of a CFD, in other words, but I drew Little's Law and I just drew the kind of expanding crocodile. So I drew the, I drew the flow and then I drew the expanding crocodile and then I just drew the horizontal line. The class was dead quiet. And once I draw on the second explanation of how increasing whip expands potentially, right, the, the cycle time, he he had this kind of, I get, like this moment of, I get it. <laughs> it's <was> just, <laughs> and it was, you know, it was just that magic moment that yeah. he sat through quite a lot of content to get to that point. And then all of a sudden, it, the, the, ah, now I understand why you're telling me about whip, you know, why you've been banging on about whip for, you know the last year now i get it now i get what you're on about that was the moment, that um, was the moment. talking about product owners, we've got another question in in chat um and we got about eight minutes to go so let's take that question um i read it aloud just in case for for the audience and video is a monitoring cycle time and keep healthy discussions about trends is always very powerful especially with a product owner yes I think, I mean, I think the answer is yes, but I, I'd say I'll clarify that a little bit, right? So, um, uh, again, in the book, but this is, you know, it's a real story. It's a, again, as somebody said, cheesy, but no real. Um, we had a, we had a, uh, I was working uh, multiple teams and we were just got the license for Actionable Agile. So for those out there who don't know what Actionable Agile is, it's a forecasting tool that can plug into your JIRA or it's standalone so you can upload your own, own data into it. Um, uh, I don't get a kickback for selling it, but if I did, I'd probably be far better off than I am now. <laughs> anyway, so so um, what it allows you to do is it allows you to look at your Jira data and say, for X date, right? It'll provide you with that Monte Carlo look and and do all the cycle time scatter plot. But but Monte Carlo was particularly what we wanted it for. For you know X date being a, a time after Christmas, which is a time you should never plan a release. Um, <laughs> Uh, but after Christmas, you know, how, well, are we, the, the question for the management was, are we going to make our release, right? You know, are we going to get the MVP? Oh, I love that term. Mm. Right. So are we going to get, <laughs> so uh, plug the numbers into to actionable and depending on team, it was coming out with varying different things, right? So there are a few teams where it said, we're not going to make it, right? This was November to January a couple of teams that said we're not going to make it and presenting that to a product owner and saying you're going to like the uh, actionable agile is telling me you you're going to achieve 50 things by January like I looked at your backlog you got 88 and product owner went "Ah," like you know freaked um I need to get everybody in a room we need to go and you know go and (laughs) <laughs> we need to go and cut the backlog lovely guy um lovely guy uh, uh working with a uh, brilliant product owner and yeah he, loads of fun anyway so he, he got the team in the backlog. they came out and the backlog had almost doubled again you know it's like they'd had the conversation we've got limited capacity and all of a sudden we've got more to do yeah yeah right all of those oh my camera's gone all of those things um uh all those things that they weren't talking about kind of dropped uh you know dro- dropped out of focus much like my camera come on camera come back to me come back. Yes. On, do it's in my big head i don't know but yeah anyway so the, so all these things they weren't talking about yes. um uh just weren't weren't uh you know weren't weren't being talked about weren't part of the backlog and all of a sudden their backlog had doubled so so yeah no you know michael you you're absolutely right um we have to you know from my point of view the product owner is part of part of the scrum team hence you know should be just as connected with the metrics and forecasting as anybody else you know we we have to have those conversations Uh, well as you were talking about this one thing that was reminding me is the typical conversation that you if you're for even if you're forecasting let's say that we're doing forecasting i would say look the forecast is showing us that we have like you know with with enough confidence it's going to be the 30th at the end of march and then someone says, like, but, but can you do it by mid-February? <laughs> you can put the metrics and say, like, well, yes, but we only have 5% chance to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's a question about risk. Do you want to take those odds? Yeah. Well, it, well it's, also, it's also when you say it, what do you want, right? Because 
as you say there's a percentage like right now you know as you said joining this when we said you know uh, aws was down you know, for meetup um you know there's a percentage risk tomorrow we might not get anything at all right so you know i think uh there's always that conversation to be had um uh you know the way i talk about the sle the, the, you know based on cycle time is is uh, talking about it from the risk perspective, so it's it's not an eighty five percent chance; it's a fifteen percent risk. Yes, exactly. You know, or and, do you want something a little bit more certain? Yeah, and and it hopefully also generates much more collaborative conversations because then it's about risk: how much risk yes. do you want to take? What's your yeah. tolerance? Yeah. Um, mindful about the time, so you know you you've, you've written the book, um, a Scrum and Kanban story of Katie and Charlie. Um, what's next what's 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 um what's andy you know when we have another another session like this in a few months time what's next because uh, yeah i, I mean I, i've been i've been toying so so the book follows a, a scrum master called katie on her journey through through using scrum but actually discovering kanban and, and applying it and that hence the book right it's written for people who are doing whatever they're doing but actually utilizing Kanban to have better conversations, right? And that's the whole purpose of the book. And it is generally based upon my experience with the theory embedded and a story over the top. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's really there to help people learn. So I've been thinking about a sequel for the book, but it's not fully, the idea isn't fully formed. I'm not sure where to go with Katie. I mean, Katie's obviously gonna go somewhere with it. Um, but the other, the other the other idea is to try and extend um, some kind of uh, conversation piece around actually just digging into experience. You know, kind of um, much like you know, you're kind of digging into my my Nokia, you know, however many years ago experience. There's a whole load of lessons to be taken from that stuff. We just don't share. So there's so there's some stuff around there. But yeah, I don't know where I'm what. Yeah, 2022, isn't it? We're going into, I don't know. I haven't, haven't figured my plan out yet. It's on the backlog. There you go. <laughs> isn't that the answer? It's on the backlog. We, we, we will keep stalking you for to see what the next projects are. And yeah. Is. Um, unless there is one final answer, answer question from the, from the group. Um, other than that, um, we're almost at the, at the time. We're going to keep, you know, I'm Spanish. I never do time, but this time I can probably do time. So unless there is any, any final question, um, I just want to say thank you to, to Andy. Thank you for everyone that is attending today. Um, this video, if you're watching it, it will be in the um, Lineage of London YouTube channel, but join the either Lineage of London, Pro Kanban, um, meetup groups. That's where we try to have like um, events like this bringing things together. What, what are you going to show us? And yes, go to Amazon and get that book. Um, it says that it's a pointless story, but it's not a pointless book. It has it, a yeah, definitely not a pointless book, but it is. It, uh, uh, yeah, it's not even a pointless story. But yeah, it's um, yeah, you, you'll enjoy it. I've uh, great yeah. feedback so far. I'm really so, so proud of where it's gone. Yeah. Um, thank you, Andy, again, for for giving us your time. It's, it's you're more than welcome. Anytime. Thank you for all of you to, for attending and Hopefully, yeah, we will we will be um, announcing another session with uh, a different trainer um, soon, probably for the new year now. Um, but yeah, um, stay in touch. Um, you can be connected, as I say, through the YouTube channel um, for for Lineage and London. Um, there is a Pro Kanban Slack community. Just search Slack Pro Kanban um, or go to ProKanban.org, and in the ProKanban.org you can find the meta group. You can also find the the Slack channel. And that's where you know people like Andy, myself, many other trainers and people from the community are there. So engage, engage in any sort of questions, conversations, and it's just great sharing and learning together. So thank you very much. Have a lovely time. Can we say Merry Christmas already? Yeah, it's December. We're good. December isn't it? We're allowed. Yeah, I had that question <laughs> in September. So I've been, I've been in Christmas more since then. Um, okay. Have a lovely Christmas for those for those of you that celebrate Christmas. Um, have a, a wonderful time, wonderful new year soon. Bye. Thank you.